Hey there friends, I'm continuing to experiment with screen resolution, size of screen, things like that. I'm very much kind of a, a one-man show like the monkey that, you know, they put out for tips that has the little drum on the back and the little cymbals and, you know, uh, play the guitar. I'm trying to um, inspire others. A lot of you have higher level skills uh, in multiple dimensions. To pick up on some interesting themes here, don't feel bound to my low end sort of I'm not dissing my channel. I think it's a good channel. I'm doing a lot with a little, but I just wanted to say when it comes to generated graphics and so on, if you're a blender guru or something like this, you have opportunities to use skills I don't have. For one thing to get across, okay, I talk about high school math, high school synergetics, the future of high school, what the curriculum could look like. And I think the Descartes deficit, let's call it that, let's stick with Descartes on this one. Um, Descartes deficit and its relationship to the Goldberg polyhedra, which, let me pull up some of those, have been a theme here. I've been showing off Popko. He gets into these a lot. I've been calling them hexapens. It makes sense that as the guy who started the campaign Hexapence for Everyone, HP4E, uh, that I should now be deluged with information on Hexapence. I mean, I asked for it, right? It's like, good. I'm glad. I mean, I should be up on it since I made it a campaign. Now, I called them Hexapence. And I think George Hart might be the one who's proposed that we call them Goldbergs. The topology of a Goldberg, though, is somewhat specific. It's not just a hexapen, and this is something I alluded to a couple videos ago in this Wikipedia page here, makes that clear. What you want to achieve is Descartes' deficit, by which I mean 720 degrees. So the number of degrees in any tetrahedron, if it's 180 per triangle times 4, right, in this tetrahedron you could say 720 degrees of angle are represented by the way I'm, I'm using Lux here and as a toy and a modeling uh, setup but you can use anything any polyhedron if you count how much degrees are missing around its ed its corners how many degrees are missing by which how much does it differ from flatness let's just talk about purely convex polyhedrons, nothing with spikes, just to keep it simple for now. And let's just, you know, look at convexity as a concept, like we do in synergetics, concave, convex. It's kind of a, a logical beginning. If you're looking for axioms, it's these kinds of, like, fragmentary knowledge of what a clop. Sorry, Popko's book, it, it didn't get hurt. So what we want to do is explain in our high school curriculum or even earlier that there's going to be 720 degrees missing from all of these convex polyhedrons meaning that if you take how many degrees missing around each vertex from 360 how many degrees are actually there 90 90 90 3 times 90 9 times 3 27 270 degrees in each corner of a cube okay so <clears throat> If you add up all the missing degrees, as if 360 minus what's really there, do that for every vertex, add up what each one had to pay to be pay to play. In other words, I, I call it the sphere tax. In order to contribute to convexity, everyone needs to contribute to convexity. And in this perfectly equal system, Every vertex contributes exactly the same tiny amount of sphere tax. Now, why do I say tiny amount? Because in a cube, it's actually 90 degrees uh, have been paid, right? Well, look at the Goldbergs here. Notice how they get more and more spherical with the higher and higher frequencies, right? So that's approaching sphericity. It's like looking at a bathroom floor. If you look at a normal hexapent, you know, the, the number of hexagons can, can increase astronomically, still with the, the 12 pentagons. And so when you're a tiny creature yourself, standing on this, what appears to be a plane, flat to the horizon, and everything around you is a hexagon. You're standing on a desert or a plane, a perfectly flat, it looks to you. 
But there is a very, 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 very slight convexity. It's a giant planet. You're very small compared to the sphere. So to you, it looks like just regular hexagons. But actually, if that were true, if they were all regular hexagons, it would be a perfectly flat plane, but it's not. It's very slightly, very slightly curved, and that's what these Goldbergs are talking about here. You know, it's getting astronomically number of vertices, right? It's getting higher and higher. Very beautiful and very good to think about. And think about how each little vertex in this picture is paying what I'd call a sphere tax. And all of the contributions added up make 720 degrees, which we associate with a tetrahedron. Descartes did not necessarily associate with tetrahedron, but Bucky does. And you can say, well, it's not mathematically proven. There should be that association. And that's why I say synergetics is more about mnemonics, about holding things together. Um, gravitation, as if memory had gravitational power. Also, let's take a brief look at quad rays here. This is a long-standing theme of this channel. I'm going to finish up on this. And this has been a very interesting development. I don't know how long Tom has been aware of this little fact, um, but it's interesting. By the way, I'm reaching into my pocket because Tom is the one who made this high, high-quality um, magnifying glass, which I need to keep it clean. It looks, it's very, very um, precise. And anyway, very early on, he's not really a huge Bucky fan. He's just very good at linear algebra and really understands it. And he's interested in quad rays enough to have contributed. He doesn't necessarily take it in any way as something to uh, get too interested in. And I've, I've come to the same sort of low-key peddling of quad rays, and that I say it's just an API to XYZ. It's another way to use XYZ coordinates, because that's what I actually have going under the hood in order to talk to ray tracing programs or to talk to any other programs. Eventually, I have to convert everything to XYZ. So it feels to me, as I talk in quad rays and do random walks in the matrix and so on, it feels to me like I'm sitting on top of something that's sitting on top of XYZ as an API. But what's interesting, here's the um, well-known volume of a tetrahedron in XYZ is that matrix. One six of, and it's the determinant of this matrix. And you can just see each, co each row is an XYZ coordinate of a point. You got four points, four rows. Four points make a tetrahedron. So you got four points, four rows, and then you put ones in the final column, makes it a square matrix, you find the determinant. And if you always want a positive volume, you gotta get the absolute value because there might be a negative sign in your answer. Uh, it depends on the row, of the, the order of the rows and all of this. And then take a sixth of it and you've got the volume of that thing. Now what uh, Tom has shown me and I check out in this Jupyter Notebook and add it to our High School of Tomorrow or School of Tomorrow repo, is that this simple matrix one-fourth of, and then you lie in the four uh, vertices again of a tetrahedron, any tetrahedron, in quadre coordinates. And quadres are linear combinations of these elementary vectors. And you can call them basis vectors, but then you're going to get into... Um, kind of a little bit of a, a language, how much overlap, right? In my view, in mathematics, you need a few kind of intuitive, basic, sort of consistent insights. And then around that, you can build using the clay of well-known words that everyone else is using too, but in a different way. So I don't feel like we're forced to not use the word basis vectors just because we mean something a little bit different because we don't have the notion of independence as much. Everything is 4D in this uh, synergetics namespace in that it has volume, even points, lines, and planes. You can see as lumps, we're following Carl Menger, and he proposed, hey, we could make up a geometry of lumps where everything has the same dimensionality. 
And it seems to, I would say, some people outside of math that, whoa, gosh, that's huge. I mean, how can you change math? Thinking of math as monolithic, whereas I always think of it as board games. You walk into a, a toy store or supermarket even, and there's just stacks and stacks of board games, or call them language games. Those are all the maths. There are so many. You know, when I went to Princeton, that was like the math library was three floors, all by itself, just math books. And it's not really right to think in terms of some monolithic thing called math. It's a lot of maths out there. But we don't speak so many languages that when we invent a new math, we want to invent all new words for everything. No. So we use, we recycle a lot of words, and it helps if the associations are already there, like for dimension, how we think the word dimension, how it already fits into language. Very useful to, to use that word and bend the meaning a little bit. So there's a lot of meaning bending going on. You know, I live in Portland. We talk about Portland as being kind of a gender bender town. Well, meaning bending goes on all the time. And I think synergetics is one of those lenses that the light bends as you go through. But then a lot of authors are like that. That's what philosophical writing is like, if it's good. And here we're um, just comparing the two volume formulas and using this opportunity to reiterate about the synergetics constant, the conversion constant for going back and forth between these two regimes, these two ways of thinking about volume, dimensionality, whatever. Two different namespaces, two different units of volume. All right, talk to you soon.